Welcome to Thank You for Your Service, Wisconsin Rapids Community Media. My name is Tom Heiser and I will be your host. Today we will be talking with veteran Vietnam and Korea, Tom Sox, who is very active in many veterans organizations in the Wisconsin Rapids area. Tom, thank you for your service. Okay, I want to get to know you a little bit. Where are you from? Wisconsin Rapids. Lived here all my life. East side, west side? Well, west side. Grew up on the west side. Always lived on the west side. Uh, after I got out of the service, I got married and lived on the east side. Okay. So what high school did you go to? Lincoln. Went to Lincoln. Okay. Did you go on to college at all? No. What branch of service? Army. Enlisted. Was there any other one? <laughs> enlisted or drafted? I enlisted. Why? Ever since I was a little kid, I had three older brothers. Uh, oldest one was in the Navy, who I never really knew. He's 18 years older than I am. Next brother, uh, he was the one that, oh, I won't say inspired me, but yet uh, he was the one that, he was my hero. Uh, he was in the Army. He was in during the Korean War. And, uh, and I had another brother. Uh, he was in between Korea and Vietnam. So uh, Army was my, had to join the Army. That was okay. my. So how old were you when you joined? 18. Okay. And uh, now we're going to show your age. What year did you join? Not that you remember the old things, but April 27th, 1964, one thirty on a Monday afternoon. <laughs> um, your family had military background. You mentioned all your brothers and stuff like that. So is that your motivation to enlist, or oh. was it because of at that time Vietnam was just starting? No, my brothers uh, had aunt, or other uncles that were also in the service, and... Uh, I figured if they were, I had to also, so. Okay. Living in Rapids when you joined? Yep. Anybody enlist with you? No, that was in 64, April 64. Uh, didn't have anybody, uh, I know a few kids, uh, friends of mine after I enlisted, that uh, I don't know if that was uh, setting a trend or if it, matter of fact, I'm not sure if they were drafted or not. But uh, when I <laughs> when I enlisted, uh, I don't know if I'm going to get off on this or not, but uh, I was uh, guaranteed Germany. That was one thing I, I wanted. I wanted to go to Germany. And uh, so here I'm, oh boy, I'm going to go to Germany. Uh, back then, uh, when you enlisted, I reason I, well, I enlisted for Germany, but I say there was. Uh, uh, I didn't get to pick my field that I wanted to be in, and so I got stuck in an artillery unit. And uh, so, being guaranteed Germany, I figured, well, I can put up with being an artillery, but it turns out uh, I didn't get the great Germany either. <laughs> okay, backing up just a little bit. So, you enlisted, and they're telling you Germany. Where was basic? Fort Leonardwood, Missouri, which is also known as Fort uh, Lost in the Woods, or also known as Little Korea. Right. I'll get to that later. Okay. Um, what did you, you envision it to be like? What would the military be like to you in your mind? Well, pretty much what I what I did. I expected uh, basic training, uh, the different types of uh, uh, what you did during basic training, and that you uh, uh, bit whack and all those other different things. Uh, it was pretty much what I expected. Drill instructors, what you expected? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, back then, um, we didn't have this. And I think it was right after that. It's called wet bulb temperature, with a, the humidity and the, the temperature reached such that you didn't have to drill. You didn't have drills. Uh, we just temperature didn't make no difference. So you're in a spring in Missouri. Oh, yeah. Rain. A lot of rain. Uh, very unfortunate, and uh, really won't forget it. Uh, our first week, uh, we were going out on a, it was raining that morning. Of course, you wore your ponchos. And I forgot where, anyway, two guys got hit by lightning and killed. And that was, well, no, that was, beginning of basic training. 
Okay, so Fort Leonard Wood. Then where'd you go for your advanced training? Well, I came home for two weeks from, uh, after basic. Uh, we had seven weeks, or I think it was seven weeks of basic, or nine weeks altogether, and then uh, came home and went to uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. I got there, that was in August, or not July, August, I think it was. Uh, that was another awakening, 106 degrees temperature, but it was a dry heat. So Fort Sill, Oklahoma, what was your job? I, that's where I had AIT for had advanced individual training for artillery. And uh, they basically uh, teach you how to fire the guns and di different positions on the guns there. Like I say, it was not really my choice uh, to go into artillery, but because of being guaranteed Germany, you know, well, okay. that's what I wanted. But So, you finished AIT. So how do they spell Germany? K-O-R-E-A. Okay. Uh, at the end of the AIT, um, we had a big battalion formation. And uh, they're all lined up out there, and they're saying, uh, calling or uh, naming off the individuals and where they're going. And the uh, first five guys uh, are going to Korea. And of course, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you poor schmucks, who would want to go to Korea? Nobody in the right mind would want to go to Korea. And again, not that you remember, but there was Johnson, Schroyer, Owens, Modisett, and Sox. I'm not going to Korea. Shut up, you're going to Korea. <laughs> Why do you feel that you were chosen to go to Korea because of your standing in a class? No, I guess um, as I was told, uh, they send you where they need you. And uh, for what good it did to try to argue, it didn't, you don't argue with the government. Uh, so I, uh, what I, 12 months and 21 days or spent in Korea. Uh, I was up a couple miles into DMZ, which was quite a learning experience also. So did you fly over or boat? Yeah, flew, well, I, I went over on a ship. Took us, uh, I can't remember, it was 21 or 23 days. All expenses paid. Trip, I got to stop in Hawaii, uh, Japan, uh, uh, Hawaii, Yokohama, Okinawa, and then Korea. And, oh yeah, it was, it was something different. So you related Fort Leonard Wood to little Korea. Fort Leonard was called Little Korea because of the hills, ups and downs. And when you got to Korea, anybody who's been in Korea knows it's all hills, up and down, up and down. And uh, uh, all in all, I guess I really, it was quite a learning experience being there. 18-year-old uh, uh, punk kid there to see the totally different culture, uh, the way people lived in, say, a third world country like that. It was... It was unreal. Um, okay, so at the time of the, the taping of our show right now, there's some waves of possible problems in Korea. Being from having served in Korea, what is your... Anybody that knows, like say, Seoul is only, what, 35 miles in a DMZ, and all along the DMZ, North Koreans have, uh, they've got artillery pieces, and I've heard anywhere from 58, 38 to 58,000 artillery pieces that are aimed at Seoul. Uh, one volley from uh, each of those guns would pretty well uh, could do a lot of damage, I'll say, in, in uh, Seoul. And there's nothing other than a fencer that's stopping people from coming in, coming down across the border. Uh, you now there's a lot of troops up in that area on the DMZ, but uh, it's really, uh, it's quite a hot spot, I think, right now. And that uh, call him a maniac that's running the country. Uh, I don't know what he's trying to prove, but it's very unfortunate. So you're in Korea, and you've got your gun emplacement is pointed to the north. Yep. What size gun did you, were you assigned well, to? At that time, we only had we had 105s, which had, they were uh, I don't even know what, what the range 15 miles. I think I can't remember what the range is on them now. Uh, but there was a lot of, uh, we were close to the artillery unit that the DMC would say were uh, probably three miles, air miles. But, um, and you had the 
when I first got over there, I was with the first calf. And uh, we switched, uh, changed colors in the spring of 65, I think it was. Second division came over and first calf went back. But all along the DMZ, you got uh, infantry units uh, right there on, uh, on the DMZ, and then you got your artillery backup. So you were assigned to an infantry unit, or the infantry uh, was assigned to the artillery unit? Artillery unit. Okay, so but the infantry was assigned to you guys, or you guys were assigned to them? Well, the infantry, they were like a uh, unit of their own. They were, like say, a couple miles in front of us. So everything, you have to go through the infantry first to get back to the artillery. Okay. So we did have somewhat protection. So what were your living conditions like in Korea? <sighs> Live in Quonsets. Uh, metal Quonset huts, um, that's pretty much what, you know, they had two heaters, one on each end. Uh, the bathroom facilities were all outside, so winter or whatever, you had to get dressed, go outside, and go to the, take the showers, whatever, come back, get dressed, then come back. But, uh, it was, the uh, winter was something different, I'll tell you. It's just, uh, one of the main things you did over there was walk guard duty. That was, um, seemed like every other day I had guard duty. Uh, and the worst part about that, you'd be out there at night on a cold winter night, and uh, North Korea had these big uh, loudspeakers and you know, some of the eerie music or songs, stuff they'd play on those. It, it was uh, something different, especially, like I say, for an 18 year old kid. <laughs> so, you Four seasons, just like Wisconsin. Oh, yeah. yeah. Winters were colder, though, weren't they? They were, yeah. You know, they were, at times it wasn't awfully bad, but it, you, know, you, had, you had a fair share of everything over there, especially the monsoons. Well, it just happened to be, and I guess you can go back and look, uh, when I was there in well, 64, 65, but 65 was uh, the monsoon season. 65 was probably, I think they said it was the worst flooding they've had in 40 years. And everything, you just, uh, villages were washed away, bridges washed away. We had the Injim River, it was just north of us there, that was between, uh, just before you get into North Korea there. And uh, during the dry season, it was just a little trickle of water running through the middle of the river there and during the monsoon season the water was up over the top up to the top of the telephone poles and how deep that was I'm not sure but they were quite steep banks to get down to the bottom of the riverbed itself but it was it was something different to see all that flooding and well what's going on here in our country now so nothing stayed dry no you okay. know so you're done with your year in Korea then where do we go I got sent up to Fort Devons, Mass. I believe you were there, so you're familiar with Fort yeah. Devons. Um, when I got up there, I was stationed with the 196th Light Infantry Brigade, and that uh, <laughs> was in uh, November of '65. Uh, and well, that rather uh, some humor to it in a way, because we were doing jungle training to go to either Santa Domingo or Vietnam. A lot of people didn't realize that there was a big uprising in Santa Domingo at that time. And we had troops down there. So here we are in Fort Devons, uh, snow on the ground, but we're doing jungle training. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, we had, uh, it, was, it was a newly formed unit, uh, 196 Light Infantry Brigade. And uh, just getting to know all the guys up there. and. Uh, I got I was up there six months, and I got orders to go to uh, down to Fort Knox, Kentucky. And I didn't realize that at the time. Well, I put in a request to stay with the unit because, I, like I said, I was just getting to know the guys, and uh, uh, well, call them friends. And it turned out that because I had uh, just came back from a hardship tour, which Korea is called it's a hardship tour. You, you had to be back in the states back then. You had to be back in the states a, a year before they could send you back overseas. So I got sent down to Fort Knox. Still in artillery? Artillery. Okay, so now you're in Fort Knox. Artillery. Artillery. What was it, what was it like down there? Well, when I was down there, I was in an eight inch 
uh, artillery unit. And of course, that's the king of battle, that 8 inch artillery. And uh, that was uh, a little bit different, at least down there. Um, the training was uh, uh, a little bit different. Um, turned out that, well, when I got down there, even uh, shortly after I got there, I put a request to go to Vietnam. Being young and foolish, still not realizing uh, what the war was all about. And uh, matter of fact, I put in two requests and I finally, finally got to go. But my six months down there, uh, again, that had to go that full year before they could set, ship me back overseas. So that's why I spent another six months down there. So you originally enlisted for three years, correct? Correct. Right. So now you're into your, well into your second year. Yep. And Vietnam is a one year tour. Yep. Re enlisted? Well, that's sort of a funny story too. When I was in Korea, me and a couple of buddies of mine trying to figure out how we could, where could we earn some extra money? Now, this is back in 65. Uh, we were getting uh, $97 a month plus overseas pay. So we're making big bucks. And uh, I figured, what the heck? So we went and re enlisted. I, I took a short, which was, I had my original enlistment was three years, and then they just uh, added one more year on, or gave me three more years and dropped the year that I had. So I ended up with four years, but we got our $97 a month for times three. So we had big money. Okay, so now you're in Kentucky and the government says, okay, we're gonna send you to Vietnam. Nervous? Not really, because like I said, at that time, I just didn't have a clue what was going on. Uh, you just you know what you've seen on the news and uh, read about it. It really wasn't uh, uh, as bad as what I thought it was. Uh, like I said never really knowing what to expect. But I learned. Okay, so now <clears throat> they've given you the blessing to go to Vietnam, and you're going to go because you had requested. You went over. Alone, you didn't go over the unit, did you? No, no. I uh, left uh, Fort Knox. Well, I come home on leave, thirty day leave, and then I went to uh, uh, Oakland Armory Terminal. That's where, uh, pretty much, if you're going overseas, anywhere in the Far East, they would uh, come out and go out of uh, Oakland Armory Terminal there. And I flew over, and. Uh, it was dark when we got there in the morning, and uh, uh, the smell right off the bat, it, it had its uh, very distinctive odor, or aroma, <laughs> as you know. Yes. Um, the 196th that you were with up in Devons, they ended up over there, didn't they? Yep. If um, you would have stayed with them, would you have gone over with them, or would you have gone to... No, I would have went over with the brigade, but the whole unit. Uh, so uh, deployed individually, but uh, of course, then I didn't know anybody when I got there. Uh, I, I didn't, shouldn't say that. I met uh, John. Uh, I can't remember his name. Is. He was from down here. He was riding, riding shotgun on our convoy when they picked us up at the airport and took us to the 25th Division, where I was stationed there. So, having served as much time as you had already, you went over there at what rank, roughly? You recall, I was a spec four, so you were a e four, a senior guy. Yeah, getting oh, yeah. over, yeah. getting over there. So you land in country and the smell, the heat. What unit were you uh, assigned to then? A battery, first battalion, eighth, first eighth artillery, twenty fifth infantry division, Kuchi, thirty miles northwest of Saigon, and still artillery. Artillery. Okay. You and I have done some presentations in our career. Talk about Coochie. 
Well, again, I had no idea um, what to expect when I got there. And uh, they took us to our home units there. And I'll never forget, uh, there was a sergeant there that uh, took us to our hooch's net, just where you'd be staying. There's some jets flying by outside the compound. And uh, I'll never forget, I asked them, are they practicing out there? My, I'll say, concept of the war, you have front lines. You go out there and fight and then you come back. Well, it turns out Vietnam was not anywhere near a conventional war. Uh, it turns out the planes were bombing right outside our compound. And that's, that's where the enemy were. I learned a lot that day. Talk a little bit about the tunnels of Coochie. Well, when the 25th Division moved in there, that was, what, in 65, 66, 65. Um, they didn't know it either, but they had built the 25th Division base camp on top of the VC tunnel complex. Now, you can imagine the 25th Division base camp, probably the size of Wisconsin Rapids, city limits. Uh, it was a pretty good size base camp. Now you put that in perspective, Wood County uh, was, Wisconsin Rapids is our base camp, Wood County was their base camp underneath us. From uh, Cambodia, which we were um, 30 miles, I think it was 30 miles from Cambodia, yeah, because it was between Cambodia and, and Saigon, we were blocking force there, 25th Division. And from Cambodia to Saigon was uh, uh, 60 miles, but they had a network of underground tunnels from Cambodia to Saigon, which also encompassed our whole big base camp. And it was it was unreal. It, and I didn't know about it at the time. I don't think a lot of people realized uh, the complexity of that tunnel network. Okay, I want to jump ahead a little bit. You went back. Oh, yeah. And you went in those tunnels. Oh, yeah. Now, a tunnel to me is something small, unique. Talk about the tunnels of Kuchi. Back then, uh, and I, uh, I can get to that later too, but I'd been down in the tunnels just and seen what those tunnels were like. But when I went back to Vietnam in 99, uh, the uh, Kuchi, they had, uh, it was a national park, and they had enlarged those tunnels where I was a little bit smaller than I am now, and uh, you'd go down in, into the tunnels, and uh, I've got a lot of pictures, a lot of videos and that of them, to see, uh, like I said, the complexity, of, it, it was just, it's mind-boggling what they, but now you gotta realize, they had been building those tunnels since Second World War, when they were our allies. And uh, so they had, uh, you know, say, the upper hand on uh, construction of tunnels because they, uh, they, they went down three stories underground. And uh, like I said, I could crawl through them now. They, they opened them up. And the ground over there was like, I mean, it was, it's not sand. It, it's like a, it was latimite or whatever it was. It's rock. And how they dug those tunnels. And, I mean, it was unreal what they could, what they had done with those. They had rooms half the size of this room here, and uh, this is all underground. And uh, they had underground hospitals. They had uh, you name it. They had it underground. It was there. The unfortunate thing is, uh, where we had tunnel rats, soldiers that smaller guys go in those tunnels and. They have a flashlight in one hand and a 45 in the other, and you'd crawl around and uh, hopefully you didn't, between snakes and fungi pits and just booby traps, uh, uh, of course back then there was no lighting in there like when I went back, they, they had little lights so you could, you, know, you could see where you're going, and uh, a whole different ball game back then. Okay, so you're still in the artillery. Oh yeah. Going out and doing your missions. Yep. And then... Uh, Remember other people in your unit over there? I 
How do you remember any? I was only with the artillery probably a couple of weeks, and uh, they asked for volunteers to go out as a uh, RTO. Okay. <laughs> Define what an RTO is. RTO is radio telephone operator, and uh, again, not uh, being sort of naive to it, uh, I didn't realize by putting that radio on your back, you had a big old bullseye. Uh, because the enemy, they take that radio out, they lose. They know you're going to lose communications with uh, your artillery units, uh, different units. Uh, so they, yeah, it was. Uh, but again, I didn't didn't know that. So this radio that you now have on your back weighs a little bit. It wasn't really that bad, but yet it. it uh, I can't remember what they are, 20, 25 pounds maybe, and then you carry your extra radio or extra batteries and extra, uh, you had a speaker on it, not like these cute little ones they have nowadays, but uh, uh, so yeah, you probably had 30 plus pounds extra to, compared to you know, with your other web gear and everything else you carried, so yeah, it was a little extra there. With an antenna that's about how long? And then that's, I was just gonna say, you had two antennas, you had a little, uh, oh, just a floppy little thing. Uh, the range on those things are PRC 25s, for 25 you call them, and the range wasn't wasn't very good. And if you were in between any hills or anything like that, you would, which fortunately we didn't have any hills in the area we were at. Yeah, but you'd put this whip antenna, and it was probably uh, six foot plus high, eight foot high, and you're going through the jungles with that antenna, and uh, they had a lot of these big ant houses, ant nests built up in the trees. And I know a couple different times I hit those, one knocked it right down my back. And of course that, it was, that's not a, not a very pleasant. Okay, so you're out now in the infantry. You're yeah. the same unit, but your MOS has now changed from artillery to infantry? No, the MOS stayed the same, but I just, uh, it was a different, uh, what is it, uh, uh, where is it? I had a 13, uh, artillery is 13 Fox, or 13 Bravo, I forgot, it went to 13 Fox, that, I forget just how it is now, but the infantry MOS are 11, mm -hmm. and uh, artillery is 13, uh, and that didn't change any, but, uh, uh, just that when you was with the infantry, I don't know, after I'd been there for a while, I'd consider that my home more so than I did the artillery. Okay. I got to know the guys a uh, little bit better. So now you've got close friends. Yeah. Well, when I was with an RTO, you're with a CP group, that's command post. You have your company commander, your uh, uh, liaison, the lieutenant, second lieutenant for uh, for the we'd call an artillery fire, and there were supposed to be three of us. Uh, there'd be an officer, uh, RTO, and uh, you know, the sergeant. And <laughs> excuse me, very seldom they ever have a full complement of the three of us. Uh, after I'd been there for a while, there would be a uh, an RTO and a, a, a officer or uh, NCO, uh, RTO. Uh, like I say, very seldom I had a full complement. Then I, after I made sergeant, well then I was, I did all three jobs. Uh, would have, like I say, the, I didn't have an officer, so I would call an artillery or I'd have my RTO call an artillery. Casualties in your unit? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, very unfortunately. Uh, every day would go out. Somebody would get either killed or wounded. Um, and that was very common, I guess. Uh, mainly booby traps. Uh, we got a lot of ambushes and stuff like that. And uh, But uh, booby traps were the, the main source of uh, casualties. You were injured. Yeah. If you're comfortable, can you talk about oh, what yeah. happened? 
I uh, I've always put it well. No, I uh, I got trapped on the leg from a booby trap, and uh, so I, we were out. It was Operation uh, uh, Cedar Falls. It was the first big operation we were on. And what, at that time, it was one of the biggest ones uh, during at, of the war over there. And it was in January of '67. And uh, I got strapped on the leg and uh, spent a week in the hospital. Uh, nothing serious. Uh, the guy that uh, stepped on the movie trap, uh, uh, he, he was a lot worse off than I was. But uh, that happens. Wrong place at the wrong time. Okay. So. Other than the Purple Heart, any other medals or citations that you uh, won while you were over there? Yeah, I got a. You're pretty much uh, standard issue, I guess. Uh, well, I don't know how, but I got a good conduct medal. Um, uh, there's a few others. I'm still waiting for my Bronze Star. I've been waiting 40 some years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, paperwork. So you're in the infantry. What was everyday life like for an infantry unit soldier? Well, the thing I really liked about being out there with the infantry, flying helicopters. They very seldom uh, convoyed anywhere. They had come in in the morning, pick us up in choppers and fly out. And I'll never, <laughs> I'll never forget the first combat assault they went on. Uh, got in the got in the helicopter and. Didn't know what to expect or what to do. So I'm sitting, they got, you look in the Hueys, you can see there's a bench seat in the middle there. And of course, I hop in there and I said, I want to put my seatbelt on. Hmm. Guys started looking at me like, okay, well, again, I, I didn't know. And uh, so we went out to our uh, uh, LZ there and we get all there and we're getting shot at. It was, it was, Pretty well shot up everywhere, and uh, everybody's out of that helicopter like now. And here I am sitting with a stupid seatbelt on. You know, say it was a very <laughs> learning experience. <laughs> Never again. So you also had another incident where you jumped out of a helicopter, and well, that was the same time. <laughs> of course, you had to bring that one up. Uh, I say I had the radio on my back and all my other junk, and uh, I say we're getting shot at, and uh, everybody's getting shot up pretty bad there. When I jumped out, um, I had to run probably oh, 50 yards or so to the, uh, we are in the rice paddies there, and went over to the dike, and uh, they called in for a sit rep situation report with some battalion, and, uh, and I, on the radio, on we're getting shot at, you know. And I, I didn't. I was, I was. I'm not going to deny it. I was scared. I had first combat assault. Uh, anybody that tells me they weren't scared, uh, you know. So we got finally got over to the lake there, and uh, I got the handset the LT lieutenant there, and it was just the two of us at the time, and uh, so I figured everybody else just shooting, so I pulled the rifle up to. I'm going to take a shot too. Well. I didn't realize it until later. Uh, I fired the first round and blew the bottom out of the magazine and split my bolt. And so, I, what the heck happened? Well, it turns out when I jumped out of the chopper, I must have stuck the barrel of the rifle in the mud. Never bothered to check it. But uh, so here you are in a combat zone getting shot up with no weapon. But that was not something that was totally uncommon. No, um, like say, me, me being a newbie to stuff like that, uh, a lot of guys would have a little uh, little plug over the barrels. They'd have different, uh, but you you d didn't jump out of the choppers. You know, it told you. I learned. <laughs> okay, so I'm a you, quick learner. <laughs> your unit comes back to base camp. Yep. And you're not going out for a couple of days. What's What's it like at base camp when you're off, for lack of a better term, off duty? Oh, uh, go to the PX. You know, just uh, so good. I didn't drink my whole tour in Vietnam. Um, I believe it was Christmas. I drank that night. 
the day before I left. But uh, a lot of guys go to the NCL club. Um, it was well, different things like that. You'd pass time away, just go walk around, uh, go different areas. Uh, there really wasn't much to do there at the time. Um, we did have outdoor theaters, uh, watch movies at night. But just sit around and be us. So your base camp, did you ever go outside the base camp other than on assignments? Uh, well, Coochie was just a little village down the road. And, uh, you'd go down there, and again, it was, uh, I forgot how far, it wasn't that far away. And you'd go down and look around the stores there and stuff like that. And there, there were other things you could do if you wanted to, but... It was, it was, again, something different. But being in Korea and, and seeing what uh, uh, Southeast Asia was like, you know, that was more Southeast Asia, but uh, the, the people and uh, pretty much the same standard of living. Write a lot of letters? Oh, yeah. Receive a lot of letters? Oh, yeah. Um, and, of course, uh, you know, between my parents and my sisters, um, that was most of my letter writing. I had a girlfriend. I had a girlfriend. And the old uh, Dear John letter. Mm -hmm. I was not exempt two months before I come home. Yeah. Have pretty good supplies and equipment? I'm sorry, what? Have pretty good supplies oh, yeah, and equipment? Yeah. And, uh, like I said, this is uh, 66 and uh, 66, 67. Uh, Pretty much, we would have uh, stuff come in all the time. We were out in the boonies, whatever. Um, never really had any uh, big problem with supply. Uh, you know, we were, uh, one incident, we were out uh, Dodge City, it was called, and uh, it was a pacified village where uh, there wasn't supposed to be any enemy there. So uh, as we're uh, going through this village, and uh, we get shot at, but you can't shoot back. Well, okay, on well, this, you know, it's not quite the way I uh, figured war is supposed to be. You can shoot at, you get shot at, you can shoot back, but no, that's not the way it was. So a couple of days this happened to us. We went through this, and uh, right in the same area, we just get shot at. You know, they knew we couldn't shoot back, so. On the third day, well, unfortunately, we got orders from up above that if we get shot at, we can return fire. And that's what the guys were waiting for because uh, it was uh, it was not pretty. A uh, company of uh, uh, infantry got roughly 120 guys. We didn't have, never had a full uh, complement of uh, uh, soldiers there. So anyway, there's say 100 guys, and they just cut loose anything that moved. To, Fortunately, there was nothing around that, and uh, like so, we took a big head shears and just mowed off anything and everything that was there. Well, then uh, I seen uh, one of the guys. They seen a, uh, and I think I don't know, just a innocent old papasan or not. I don't know. He come out of one hooch and ran over to another, and the guys went over and got him and told him to did him out, take off down the road. Uh, the frustration sets in at this point. There, the guys were just, uh, like I say. You get shot at day after day and you can't shoot back. So this, again, I don't know if he was just a poor innocent pop son or not, but 21 guys were lined up on the road. And when he took off running down the road, they all cut loose on him. And couldn't tell as a human being. There was just a pile of nothing laying there. So you said earlier you thought a war was front line. Front line. You talked about you had gone through this village two or three times prior to this incident occurring. So... Even though you had been through it, there's still not un that's still an unsecured area in Vietnam. Oh, yeah. I'd say it's a pacified village, and, and VC knew it. Uh, they had different areas, a lot of a lot of places like that uh, where you go in there and uh, not supposed to be VC there, but they were. So you talked earlier too about the tunnels of Kuchi. So when you go out to these fire bases or LZs, whatever you go to. You're still probably on top of those. Oh sure, they were everywhere. Complexes. Anywhere and everywhere. It's just like I say, the 
that goes back to the Second World War. Uh, like I say, they uh, they had just a mass of uh, uh, infrastructure of tunnel works Ev anywhere and everywhere. But Coochie was excuse me one of the main areas for that, and I think it, because of the proximity from Cambodia to Saigon, that's why I think they they redid a lot more of, in that area. That was main you're gonna say main thoroughfare from Cambodia to Saigon. So they're moving they supplies. Could, moving supplies because we couldn't go into Cambodia. Well, that <laughs> brings up another. Uh, I was there in '66, and I believe our president uh, made a comment: uh, "No American troops will set foot in Cambodian soil." Hmm. Well, I think it was April, or, uh, November, or December, December '66. We went into Cambodia. It's supposed to be a POW camp there, and uh, that turned out is empty. But uh, yeah. So you were going in there to try to rescue some of your troop soldiers, perhaps. But they got the word, and uh, you know, as to when what uh, when they're moved out of there, no idea. But uh, but it's just uh, another government uh, statement. Okay. Um, while you're over there, a lot of stress. You said it out the bush, movies. Oh yeah, um, we had an incident one time. Uh, talk about that or uh, there's a law, so two about that long light any tank weapon. It's used. It's about so big around, and it, it fired a pretty uh, high explosive projectile. You can knock out a tank with it. We used them blowing up bunkers and. Uh, in general, it was just a, a good piece of equipment to have with you. And we were leaving, went on a patrol one morning, and uh, we got uh, got hit. And uh, one of the guys was going to fire law, and uh, it just sort of popped out of the tube. It didn't, and for whatever reason, uh, somebody up above, a major, uh, requested to bring that round back with us. So that night we came back to our base camp. And uh, I was probably 30, 40 yards away from, it was the first platoon. And uh, it was dark at, that night. And I uh, was sort of sitting there and I just, just crawled in my little bit of foxhole tent thing there. And all of a sudden there was a loud explosion and uh, started yelling at incoming. I thought we were getting mortared. And then I uh, heard the guys just screaming and crying. and. Uh, Grabbed my flashlight and I ran over to where it was at, and uh, it was 21 guys sitting in a circle. And uh, Senator Wadowski was a young second lieutenant, just getting to know the guy. And uh, matter of fact, they had a write up in the paper about him being an inspiring young officer. And what I understand it was that when I, when I, you couldn't tell it was a Front was blown off. It was, it was gone, and I looked on his lapel and I see the had the tenant bar, and so I, I figured it was. And uh, so I ran over to our CP and uh, told all the uh, captain and all the officers there what had happened. And uh, well, I didn't know what had happened at the time. So I ran back, and uh, by then they you know, called in medevacs, and uh, three guys were killed and eighteen wounded out of the twenty-one guys. Uh, you know, guys talk about uh, you know, crawling around in the dark, picking up body parts. Uh, something you don't forget. No. So you talked earlier about passing time. You go to the PX and just around whatever. Ever taken a USO show? Well, that was one of the uh, nicer things that we had. Uh, I was there in in, uh, in '66. We had the Bob Hope Christmas show, and. Uh, well, we didn't know it at the time. Uh, we were waiting uh, for a Christmas dinner there, and uh, they said Bob Hope was coming to our mess hall. Wow. Well, of course, a lot of people nowadays they don't know who Bob Hope was. So we're standing outside the mess hall waiting for Bob Hope, and uh, this Jeep comes driving up, and for you guys don't the, us old timers would know Chris Noel. She was a, a movie star. But she was also a disc jockey over. She went back to Vietnam and she ended up as a disc jockey. 
she was our version of the Hanoi Hannah. So we're standing there waiting to go in the mess hall, and they, she comes driving up. And beautiful blonde with a. Anyway, <laughs> so she comes walking in, she went to mess hall, and we're still waiting there, and waiting and waiting. And so finally, they said, No, well, figured he wasn't, Bob Hope wasn't coming, so they let us go into the mess hall. So we got in the mess hall, and it uh, wasn't 10 minutes later, and he comes walking in carrying his golf club, and sat right behind me in the mess hall. Well, it made me mad because they told us we couldn't take pictures. They wanted to you know, flash in, in the mess hall. Or, of course, we had our little Kodak and Stomatic. We didn't have our smartphones. And uh, so I never got did get any picture of them. But then after uh, we had a Thanksgiving dinner or a Christmas dinner there, we went to the uh, USO show. And uh, I was probably uh, only a few feet from the stage. Well, there was Bob Hope. Uh, Chris Noel, Phyllis Diller, Joey Heatherton, Anita Bryant, and I think Korean Kittens was a another uh, act they had. But that was uh, so I you know, a couple different. Uh, and then I seen uh, uh, Martha Ray. Uh, we had Miss World, uh, Miss Miss Universe pageant, uh, and her, Miss Universe and her pageant. Uh, they came over. I can't remember who else was there, but no, it, was, it was really something different, you know. Uh, oh, J James Garner, he came in our, our unit. That's when I was back with the artillery after I got uh, wounded. Uh, I'd say I spent a week in the hospital, and then uh, I stayed back to the artillery unit there because my RTO position had been filled. And so I had to sit around with the artillery again and before I got back. But while I was back there with him, uh, that's when James Garner came into our, our unit. So, uh, yeah, a lot of celebrities over there. You're talking about some of the sad times over there, the injuries and death and whatever. What were some of the good memories? Well, i say the USO shows, uh, oh, a couple different times there. I was back with the artillery unit. We were, uh, Different areas that we were, we were set up at. Uh, and we had, uh, I've got pictures of it. Uh, there was a uh, big, well, we had a, it was a swimming hole. That was our, where uh, artillery, they had, uh, well, pretty much a circle there, and you got the artillery. But down the road a little ways, they had this, uh, like the engine corps engineers went in there and they, uh, they built up, or dug out a uh, great big pit. And that's what we use for swimming. And uh, that was one of the luxuries we had. And another time we were up in, uh, it was a special forces unit just down the road from us. And uh, well, we went down there every once in a while and see how they lived. A little bit more extravagant than what we had. Okay, did you take any leave while you were over there? Not in Vietnam, no. I don't know why. I pretty much had all my money sent home. Save all my money and figure I'd come home and I did. So no R and R's either? No. Okay. So now Vietnam's over. You're coming home. Is your time in service now done or are you nope. I had uh six months to go. Uh, I got stationed out in Fort Irwin, California. Yeah. Anybody that knows Fort Irwin, well, you look it up, and that used to be a POW camp in the Second World War. It's 40 miles out in the Mojave Desert, 40 miles from nowhere. And another one of these things you don't forget, uh, December of 67, I got out there, uh, the 16th or 17th, I can't remember. And uh, I flew from, well, I flew into LA, and I took a bus from LA to Barstow. And uh, <laughs> got off the bus in Barstow, and I, no, this can't be right. This is the desert, three inches of snow. And you can look that up too. Three inches of snow in the Mojave Desert, in 1967. Well, that was uh, that was uh, something else too. One of the things you remember. <laughs> so now you're coming home. You're all done. Then what do you do? Oh, pretty much bummed around for a little bit of. Uh, Went to apply for a job of Consolidated. Of course, back then, everybody had to work at Consolidated. That was 
that was the place to work. And I uh, can't remember when it was, but I got hired. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I told my dad about it because he was a pipe fitter at the mill. And I got hired a paperboard. And they call that Siberia of Consolidated because you actually had to work, <laughs> which I was told, you know, anyway. Okay, to back up just a little bit, I said you and I have done presentations in schools and stuff like that. When you were in service or after you got out, wearing the uniform was not an issue. No. No. When I came home on leave from Vietnam in 67, uh, I was treated with respect. You know, we were called baby killer. I wasn't spit on. Uh, I was home to leave for 30 plus days, and uh, every once in a while I'd wear my uniform and go out. Back then it was, uh, you're proud to wear it. Uh, people respected you. And uh, later later years in the Vietnam War, uh, the term baby killer came into effect. And it really, it's a sort of a pet peeve of mine that even guys around here would talk about uh, when they came home in 67, 68, they're called baby killers. Well, the term was not coined until after the My Lai Massacre, which came out in 69. Uh, to say they were spit on and that, I don't maybe they were, but I got my doubts. Okay, did you take advantage of the GI Bill at all? Not in as much. I, I took a correspondence course. Uh, Auto mechanics and stuff, and because uh, I, yeah, I was working at uh, paper board, and so I just I figured I had myself a living, and uh, yeah. Okay, so what lessons did you learn from the military that carried over into your civilian life? Well, that's a good question. Well, discipline for one thing. Um, well, I, I joined the guards too. I forgot to tell you. Okay. Uh, I had eleven years in the guards, and uh, that was it was when I joined. From when I first joined the guards to the time I got out, of, I had eleven years there. And uh, the reason I got out of the guards was uh, I, there was no incentive for me to stay in because I was receiving disability pay uh, for my when I got wounded and. They would deduct your uh, part of your pay because they call it double dipping, and so that's why after well, 15 years of military, well, I went to NCO Academy and uh, well, I had a lot of good times and learned a lot. Okay, here's the toughest question of all of them: Do you belong to any veterans organizations, <laughs> and how long? Oh boy, do I belong to any veterans organizations? Well, commander of the VFW, president of Vietnam Vets, 17 years, belonged to the Wood County uh, Veterans Committee, president of Allied Veterans Council, Wood County, or the uh, judge advocate for American Legion Post 9, uh, belonged to Purple Heart, belonged to the uh, Disabled Vets, yeah, belonged to. Okay, I know one of the new programs that you've got involved in recently. Can you, can you explain a little bit about Veterans Court? Oh, um, this started probably a year ago or more. Uh, you were uh, the Cross Area uh, Veterans Mentor uh, Program. It's uh, there to help veterans uh, that have been in problem. Have been in court, have uh, been in jail, and uh, different problems that they had with basic drugs and whatnot, mainly mainly drugs, and uh, and we're there to you know say mentor, and we're trying to get a court started up here. Um, Nick Grody, he's uh, ADA from Wood County, uh, ADA Assistant District Assistant Attorney. Assistant District Attorney uh, started out with uh, Judge Wolf. And then, uh, uh, well, Judd Wolf and then uh, uh, Craig Lambert, our district attorney, then he turned it over to uh, the next. 
just too time consuming, I guess. Yeah, matter of fact, uh, Thursday we're going out to lacrosse for another uh, uh, oh, uh, little seminar there on it. But uh, it, it's trying to help veterans uh, that are having problems with drugs is, is what it, uh, uh, it's there to benefit them. Uh, I don't know just exactly what all the, to say about it, but. Uh, so it's basically veterans that are involved in the criminal justice system. Right. Somewhere. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I went up to Merrill. There was a young lady up there that's having problems and to see if she qualified or not to uh, enroll in the, in, the, in the course there. And it's the long term, it, it's a couple of years that it takes you to, to, if you want to say, fulfill your commitment. Uh, it can help them out with their sentence and all that in the long run. You also mentioned the Wood County Veterans Memorial. Oh, yeah. Explain that a little bit for people that may be interested in getting a stone or something. Um, I wish I'd brought the flyer. Matter of fact, I just, uh, over at the courthouse, in front of the courthouse, we have the legacy stones. And uh, we're trying to get, uh, I don't know if people have been there, you can see, you go over there, and it's a, you can get a 12 by 12, I think it's $250, or a uh, six, 6 by 12 for a hundred and a half, so I got, and you can have your uh, name on there, uh, branch of service, whatever you want to. There's things, there's 15 characters per line, and you have like six or seven lines. Uh, it, it's just to let people know that you were in the service, uh, what you, you know, uh, you can put pretty much anything on there you want. So, but that's open to people that have a Wood County attachment, whether they're came to Wood County, lived in Wood County, or enlisted in Wood County. So somebody who lives in California yeah, from, right now has you know, Wood County. Anything from Wood County. And uh, then, on, of course, the, the memorial, the big slab on the, they have the names of the service members that died as a result of whatever, from war. Uh, especially now with uh, Agent Orange, um, the cancers and that stuff that are um, they're contacted from Agent Orange, I guess, is, and uh, different uh, problems that people are having, uh, PTSD and whatnot. Uh, but their names, as long as they died in Wood County, uh, they're from Wood County, their name we placed on the wall. Anything else you'd like to mention about uh, your service to the viewers? Oh, like I told a lot of people, I says, uh, I any problems that uh, I had, uh, I guess I, I don't, uh, first off, I enlisted in the Army. And I lied to do that. I'll get into that, though. Uh, I volunteered uh, to go to Vietnam. Volunteered to go with the infantry. I got wounded when I was with the infantry. I volunteered to go back with the infantry, uh, and I've always said I've I can't blame anybody for anything that happened to me or I did. Um, I don't look at a to get sympathy. So, but I, I enjoyed my my tours. And looking back, uh, Korea again that was another well, but I was told that uh, you know, they send you where they need you. So I guess I was needed there more than I was in Germany. But one of these years, I will get to Germany. Um, I hope. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Tom. And thank you very much for watching.